is a combination of these transformative processes that took place in the last couple of centuries from the beginning of the 18th or very end of the 17th until the end of the First World War, 1918 through 1922. Ottomans were, were faced with a problem of viability, political viability, by the 18th century. They had started to lose one battle after another and one war after another, first to the Habsburgs, Austrian-Hungarian Empire, and eventually to the Russians, when Russia began to emerge as a major power in Eastern Europe. And they had to do something about this, and they had to fix their military. So the most important motive was to protect the realm and at the same time somehow solve the economic problem of the empire as well. For they had an economy based on agricultural production controlled by a state which had used the system of agricultural production to maintain cavalry, Sipahi. So this system came under stress and eventually collapsed as the arable land under the control of the empire began to shrink, especially in Eastern, Central and Eastern Europe. So as a result of which, there was also an economic problem beyond the ability to protect the land and the populace against the encroachment of rival empires, the Habsburgs and the Romanovs. Austrian, Hungarian, and the Russian empires. Both tried to expand to the south. Now the Russians wanted to have a port city which will have a, an opportunity for trade across a large swath of the southern portions of its empire throughout the year. The warmest ports in northern Black Sea had been ice packed for six months or more every year. Therefore, sea transport was becoming perilous and difficult in wintertime. So the Russians tried to reach the Aegean Sea, controlling parts of the Ottoman Empire and eventually annexing them. And the Ottomans tried to resist this as best as they could. And the Habsburgs also wanted to extend their stranglehold over Roman Catholic populations of Eastern Europe as much as possible, and also, of course, reach south to northern Mediterranean, which would have provided them with um, an improved capacity for trade. And therefore, this locked, into the, locked the Ottoman Empire into a, an existential battle with these two empires. And most critical to this was the military. So they had to reform the military and turn it into a countervailing force that could withstand the challenge of the 
Austrian, Hungarian, and the Russian armies. So their efforts throughout the 18th century was to come up with a modern army side by side with the medieval forces and organization which I had shown you earlier. The Janissaries and the cavalryman Sipahi had worked well in the medieval times but they were no longer serving the purpose. And they could not any longer be reformed, they concluded. As they tried to erect a new army, side by side with the old one, that of course threatened the status of the old army and precipitated many revolts by the medieval armed forces, the Janissaries, and they were able to stop or crush these reforms until about 1825, when they finally lost this struggle and they were destroyed and a new arm, army was established in their place. Navy had also to be modernized. New schools were established to educate the military officers. Among them, the engineering schools. One for the Navy, mainly emphasizing eventually the mechanical engineering, branches of engineering. And one for the armed forces, other than the Navy, that is the land forces, mainly emphasizing civil engineering, road building, bridge building, etc. So all engineers were educated in the military schools. Anybody who wanted to pursue a career in engineering had to be enrolled in a military school. There was no civilian alternative to it until the Republic. And also the medical school was a military school. Anybody who wanted to become a doctor, dentist, veterinarian had to be enrolled in a military school and be a, a military officer by definition. <coughs> so, in this process, science and military intertwined in a complicated way, by default. Not necessarily by any specific design, but by default. So, the military officers and scientists began to be representing more or less the same point of view and had become the driving force for reform after the 19th century. And they came up with an understanding of good society based on science. And this image of good society clashed with an alternative image of good society based on tradition and religion, supported by the clergy, the religious establishment, which had been increasingly marginalized through these efforts of modernizing the military and whatever that required in the rest of the institutions rules and the regulations of the state and the laws of the state. This was a relatively slow, gradual process but driving towards modernizing the Ottoman state system and trying to introduce some form of contemporary practices in running the affairs of the Ottoman state. Now this especially gain speed after 1838 and 1839. Two important phenomena occurred in those two dates. The first is the free trade agreement a treaty signed between the Ottoman Empire and Britain, which opened up the markets of the Ottoman Empire to British goods, especially textile. 
but other goods as well. One year later, the Ottomans accepted and adopted whatever was necessary to change the operations of the state to conform to the contemporary practices of Western imperial powers, mainly, which began with the adoption of a series of changes by the Tanzimat reforms or beneficent reform period, as it is sometimes translated into English. It was regulatory reforms, and the term Tanzimat is about regulation. And indeed, the Sultan, very young Sultan, Abdul Majid, who ascended to the throne relatively suddenly when the most critical reformer of the Ottoman 19th century, Mahmoud II, died of a heart attack in 1839 after the Ottoman army was defeated by the Egyptian army in Kutahya, not too far away from here. And had it not been for the intervention of the British, the Ottomans would have ended then, in 1838, there, in Kutahya. That would be the end of them. And indeed, Kavalala Mehmet Ali Pasha, who was ruling Egypt at the time, would have probably moved his crown from Cairo to Istanbul and would have assumed the political power of ruling the Ottoman Empire as of then. This did not happen. Mainly the British intervened ordered the armies under the command of Kavalala's son Ibrahim Pasha back to Egypt and then set into motion first the free trade deal with the Ottoman state and then one year later Tanzimat. Now there are different perspectives followed by students of Turkish history, politics and economics as to which of these happened to be the more important date. Economists tend to take the former as the more important because that resulted in the sort of proto-colonization of the Ottoman market by the far superior British and eventually the European forces. In fact, the Ottomans had given various rights known as capitulations from the time of <coughs> Solomon the Magnificent in the 16th century onwards to various merchants representing different European states. And these had provided a favorable environment for such commercial activity for them. And they had expanded these rights to create some kind of immunity for their activities and at the same time for themselves over time. They came to be protected increasingly by major powers of Europe and this had severely restricted the capabilities of domestic merchants competing with them by this time. But this was sort of icing on the cake which had provided a great opportunity for <coughs> competition to emerge between the British firms and the domestic firms, where the domestic manufacture was still underdeveloped by most standards. It was an agricultural society and economy now facing competition from Britain and industrial power, and the most important industrial power of the 19th century. There was, it was a mismatch and there was no way that the Ottoman domestic market could withstand this kind of competition anyway. But in 1839, 
through the efforts of not only the British ambassador, but also the other ambassadors, especially the Russian. The, the young sultan who came to the throne after his predecessor, Mahmoud II, lost his life and vacated the throne, accepted this new set of changes, reforms in the administration of the Ottoman Empire, starting with introducing the idea of limited government for the first time into the Ottoman Empire, which was an oxymoron for a patrimonial traditional ruler, which of course in and of itself is a huge step. He argued, of course, and nobody else could, that he would limit his powers, which provided an opportunity for the officialdom to convert itself into a form of bureaucracy. Instead of the slave officials who had been conscripted or recruited through Dev Shirme system into officials serving the Sultan loyally without any personal status and could be dispensed with as if they were things, not human beings. And their wealth at the time of their decease could be taken back into the treasury of the Sultan unless they had established a charitable endowment, which is in Turkish known as Wakuf. It's the same word as Wakf in Arabic. And this charitable endowment was protected by the Sharia law and enabled the slave officials to leave their hard-earned worthy possessions to their offsprings once they established them as trustees of this charitable endowment, wakif, they established. And the wakifs would pay some kind of salary to them and they were pretty much protected from the encroachments of the Sultan because of the Sharia law and they would be outside of the um, taxation efforts of the state as well, pretty much so. Now some see this as a major reason why the Ottomans were unable to convert their wealth into something more profitable and establish a capitalist form of development eventually. So, there is probably a lot of truth in that, because it, this did not necessarily push people for competition, production, innovation, but instead protection of some well-established, mostly real estate, precious metals, jewelry of various sorts, etc., from confiscation. It was not necessarily very economic. It resulted in a form of hoarding and did not necessarily lead to profitable accumulation of wealth in any sense of the term. However, at the end of the Tanzimat reforms, these people now became, in legal terms, in de jure terms, legally, bureaucrats who would no longer be considered as slaves, but now they have status of officials who are legally assigned to bureaus who serve in these bureaus and their wrongdoings were now proportionately punishable to the crime they committed. So this idea of proportionality of crime and punishment was also introduced by the Tanzimat reforms and eventually into the criminal code which was drawn up in the next decade or so. And this was of course another major step. 
for the bureaucrats to become somewhat protected from the capricious, arbitrary awe of the Sultan. As I had already told you, from 120 Grand Viziers who served, 43 of them, not a small proportion, lost their lives whimsically. By the decision of the Sultan, they were killed on his demand without any trial, and many of them didn't know, and we, we don't know why they were killed even today. Many of them. So they closed down this period, and a period of importation of various laws from Western countries started. Of course, the civil code could not be wholly imported from Europe, although there was a big impact of this Napoleonic civil code on the work of these experts, jurists, who drew up the new civil law, Magella, as it was known, married some of the concepts of the 19th century civil law developments with the Roman law and the Islamic law of the time, the Sharia, and changed the very nature of the Islamic court system as well. Criminal code was more or less translated. Commercial code was more or less translated. Um, especially the commercial code was deeply influenced by Italian practices after, of the time, 19th century. And the constitution, which was more or less a translation of the Belgian constitution of 1876. In 1876, the Ottomans had a constitution for the first time. They also were able to erect institutions of representation in various localities at the level of the provinces and in these institutions people representing different communities were able to serve. They were not elected through free and fair elections. Most of them were handpicked by the governors of the provinces but still the idea of representation began to be enjoyed by the 19th century after these reforms. So many of these what had been virtually impossible changes began to occur after these, these changes. Most tend to refer to this as a form of modernization, but at the same time the power of the clergy, not only for the Muslims but for all churches of the Ottoman Empire was rolled back dramatically. Mainly because religious service began to lose its appeal. The most powerful members of the society now became associated with the state. It became possible for even the freeborn Muslims to become officials. For previously they could be only enrolled in, among the clergy and could serve as judges, qadr, or as imam, religious leaders of one kind or another. And people will follow them in prayer. And if they went up in rank, they could become mifti, and as mifti they could provide guidance to people, and also have some control over the judiciary and the religious practices of this, of, of this clerical class. That was the only route that the Muslims could take. It was the Christians mainly who were enrolled in the Janissaries and then in other echelons of power who wielded power as slave officials in the court of the Sultan. Now, after the 1839 reforms, it became possible for the Muslims to be enrolled in this system of governance as well. 
And by 1870s and 80s, it became possible for the Muslim boys to be enrolled in various schools where the language of instruction became French after these reforms by the 1840s, where many Sultani schools were established. The most famous of them, Galata Sarai, is still around. There were 500 or so of them at the time, but most of them eventually collapsed. Galata Sarai is the only one which stood up to these changes, and it's still with us today. It also has a soccer club and a basketball club. It's a sports venue as well. So it's become relatively well known. But it originally came from this secondary school system established more or less along the lines of a French lycée of the time. And the language of instruction there is still French. And now it has a university, Galatasaray University, which is the only university in Turkey established by an international treaty between the Turkish and the French governments. So, in a sense, they are protected by international law. Not like us, where we operate under the Turkish law only. So they seem to have still some kind of privileged status. And they've always enjoyed some kind of a um, privileged status because of what they were able to provide. They were able to get some of the best and the brightest minds in the Ottoman Empire and provide them with excellent education. And these people rose up in the echelons of power, served as diplomats in diplomacy, also in other offices of the new state system. And all of this required a financial reform for the old finances could no longer suffice. However, that was something the Ottomans were never able to successfully provide. In fact, the financial reforms did not lead to any kind of success until the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. And the wars of the 19th century in which they got entangled, especially the 1854 Crimean War, brought a huge burden on the state system. And they had to heavily draw loans from the international system, which they found increasingly difficult to pay back. When the Russians again attacked, in 1877-1878, which is known as Doksanu Çarbi in Turkish. This is the 1877-78 Russo-Ottoman War, or Turkish War, as the international press reported at the time. This is, of course, 1293, according to uh, the Islamic calendar, Hijri calendar of the time, and it's popularly, had been popularly known as Doksanu Çarbi by those generations who now passed away. Currently, if you ask your colleagues in this class or anybody else your age, nobody will know what Doksanu Çarbi was all about. But all the way to my parents' generation, everybody did. It left an indelible mark in the minds of the people, for a large swath of eastern Anatolia was now controlled by the Russians. And they were stopped more or less in Erzurum, again, also at Aya Stefanos, which is in Yeshilke, uh, not too far away from the airport where the planes land and depart from Istanbul Atatürk Yeshilke Airport. That's where the Russian troops were eventually stopped by the intervention of the other European powers, mainly the British, but also uh, the French and the Germans. And a major um, conference eventually um, enabled the Ottomans to save their neck again. But that was the final straw that broke the back of the Ottoman debt. In 1880s, it became, in, by 1880, it became clear that they can't pay the debt back. 
they were not generating enough revenue to pay for the salaries of the state officials, including the military and other necessary expenditures, and accumulate enough to pay back the debt. In 1881, the Umumiya Debt Agency, or the General Debt Management, was established in the Ottoman Empire, and this establishment was run by European states and bankers. They collected taxes, and those who didn't pay were put on trial by them, not in the Ottoman system, by their own courts. And when punished, they served in prisons in the buildings owned and occupied by the Yunumimi administration. The building of the Yunumimi today is housed by the Istanbul Arkeksesi. So if you visit the um, environs of that high school, you'll be able to see it. It's, on, it's a huge building overlooking the Golden Horn. If you stand at Karaköy, look in the direction across Karaköy towards Eminönü and up, you'll see a huge building on the hill uh, looking down on you with multiple stories, a grand architecture with goals, etc. Dungeons at the basement was the building where the Unumumia served. So, all of these changes did not necessarily bring about any major improvement in the way things are run. The military failed to withstand the challenge of the Russian army. In fact, the first war it was able to win was in 1897 against a much less powerful Greek army, Greek Ottoman War of 1897, which didn't last long, but that was the first major accomplishment of the military. In 1911, the military was unable to defend the Ottoman realm of what would eventually become Libya, eastern parts of Libya, Benghazi, Tobruk, Demre, etc., which are now cities you're learning due to the awful civil war going on in Libya in the last couple of years, had been attacked by Italian troops and they tried to expand their stranglehold over to the southern shores of the Mediterranean and become an imperial power colonizing that land and the military was unable to defend it. Some vigilantes, including Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, who became known by the war in Gallipoli, Dardanelles defense, eventually in a few years later, fought there against the Italians with a very humble um, local force, which was not up to the standard of the Italian forces, and they were defeated, which was humiliating enough. In 1911, in Ushi, a new treaty was established, and some of the Aegean islands, especially in the Dodecanese roads, the biggest, changed hands because of the Ushi Treaty. One year later, in 1912, the Ottomans this time fought against the Balkan armies, which were not necessarily a match to the Ottoman armies. Ottoman armies on paper looked much more strong than the um, Romanian, Serbian, um, Bulgarian, Greek armies. But at the battleground, uh, they performed dismally and collapsed. Uh, they failed to cooperate among each other, the Ottoman troops, and this is well documented, well studied by the Staff College of the Ottoman Empire and fut for future reference. There was a lot of politicking going on in the ranks of the military, and the military officers hated each other because of political reasons. They belonged to different kind of political groupings in the society, <coughs> 
and they decided not to support each other um, to avoid others from becoming heroes in this war and gaining politically, domestically at the same time, as a result of which miscommunication or lack of communication and lack of management and a poor command resulted in the dramatic collapse of the Ottoman forces in the First Balkan War of 1912. Uh, they almost lost all provinces, including Edirne, all the way into the eastern Thrace, had changed hands. But one year later, the Balkan states went into war against each other, this time not fighting the Ottomans. And the Ottomans were able to get back Edirne, Adrianopolis, which is now the current border between Turkey, Greece, and Bulgaria. And the person who actually got it was not Enver Pasha, but Enver, one of the most important members of the Ottoman politics at the time, became renowned for his heroic taking back of the Adrianopolis or Edirne, which contributed to his career and also led to some dramatic changes one year later in 1914. It was in 1915 that the Ottoman army was able to show an unbelievable capability to withstand the attacks of both the British and the French and the Anzac troops. Australian, New Zealand troops at the Straits of Dardanelles in the War of Gallipoli and defeated them. Um, it almost costed the career of Sir Winston Churchill, who seemed to, seemed to have assumed that due to this misperformance of the Ottoman military in 1912, he had assumed there would be an easy cakewalk or a yacht trip through the Dardanelles into Istanbul. And they will knock out the Ottomans in the war immediately at the beginning of the war and will therefore have an easy connection with Russia to encircle Germany during the First World War. All of that plan collapsed dismally, performed um, with their best of capabilities, but they were not able to go through the Dardanelles. Totally unexpected development under these circumstances. So from 1825, when the new army was established, until 1914, Dardanelles, there was hardly anything worth boasting about so far as the performance of the military was concerned. 1914-15, especially 1915, Dardanelles was an exception. And which was not necessarily repeated much until the War of Liberation, which started in 1919. So the reforms were not necessarily easy moving phenomena. And they did not bear any stellar success or any major fruit for a long time to come. Establishing a new army is a very, very difficult problem. We know that. Arabs are discovering it right now. It may not take them a century to come up with a meaningful army to defend their realm and run their own affairs, but the process is not going to be very easy and it's not going to bear fruit very soon. You can look at the recent developments of Iraq, for example, and look how dismal the performance of the Iraqi army has been since 2003. 11 years has passed. There's hardly anything that you can call a military in operation. The old one is gone, and the new one is not established in its place. It's a very, very difficult process. Now, the Ottomans also did not seem to have the capability of converting their rural economy into a contemporary industrial economy and their 
agricultural society into a industrial urbanized society either. <coughs> These again are very, very difficult transformations, very painful, very laborious. And Turkey has been doing that in the recent several decades, but it, it was not accomplished by the Ottomans. As a result of which, their economy suffered dearly and they were not able to do much so far as that is concerned. But in this process, they had created something which we may call secularization at the same time. Modernization efforts produce something of a secular nature in society. First of all, laws were taken out of the hands of the clergy to a great extent and sort of non-religious court systems were established. At the turn of the century, except for the civil, civil law, all law and all court system had become non-religious by definition and had been operating as such. Secondly, various disciplines had been established outside the realm of the religious education system not only the secondary schools, but higher education institutions. Not only the engineering schools, medical schools, and various health colleges, but also a law faculty was established in Istanbul, Mektebi Kuzat, as it was called, which again had become considerably secular. Women students were eventually enrolled in some of these institutions, both secondary and also higher educational institutions. And at the same time, various other disciplines, physics, chemistry, biology, etc., had become instructed both in civilian and also in military schools, not necessarily following any kind of limitations or instructions from any religious authority. So this connection between religion and education, religion and law, had been severed in the 19th century, which began to create this kind of idea. But there was more to it than this. It, it had become very clear that by the second half of the 19th century, many people considered that a good society could only be established if people followed only non-religious, rational thinking along the lines provided by science. And therefore, this image of good society built by rational thinking that got its inspiration and thinking and rationale from science emerged to take a hold of especially college education and students in college education, also in the military schools. For example, we know from the memoirs of Abdullah Cevdet who was an ophthalmologist. A very influential figure at the turn of the previous century, 19th to the 20th, and also in the 20th century developments in Turkish politics. He was born and raised as the son of an imam. He's originally from Elaziz which we call Elazo today, Eastern Anatolia. Um, ethnically speaking Kurdish. Very religious man, pious. Prayed five times a day, fasted. Did everything that was necessary for religion. When he got enrolled in the military school of medicine. At the end of the second year, he argues that he has discovered 
that it's possible by using chemistry and biology to create life in a bathtub. He argued that all he had been instructed in the name of religion is hogwash. Islam is a farce, should not be taught anywhere. It is a smokescreen to render the Ottoman youth backward. This is the most stark way of referring to it, most crass way of referring to this divide. Not everybody took the same line, obviously. Not to that extent. But it became clear that some of these people, when they met with modern science and technology, which was provided to them in abundance by Abdulhamid II after the Russo-Ottoman War, he had suspended the constitution, re-established an absolute rule that lasted for 30 years, and he ushered in enormous amount of technological innovation into the Ottoman Empire. He was instrumental in providing science education as the ruler of the Ottoman Empire from 18. 76 until 1908. And Abdulhamid II's push for natural sciences and natural science education provided an outcome totally unanticipated by him of undermining the grasp of religion further under his rule, although his policy depended upon legitimation through religiosity, increased religiosity in the Ottoman Empire. And he provided the circumstances of two clashing views emerging in the Ottoman Empire and eventually converting itself into a cultural war of some sort. Or to use a contemporary German term for it, Kulturkampf. A huge clash between these various um, groups emerging in society. But this pitted especially those who had been involved in science and science-related activities, preponderant in the military, against the clergy at the same time. So you can mistake this kind of divide and confrontation as if it were a divide between the military and the clergy, who had always been separate in the Ottoman Empire. The military had come from a Christian background and converted into Islam, and therefore clergy had always been Muslims, and therefore they were sort of different from their origins, received differently from the society, by the society, and had been reacted to differently by the society at the same time. And they of course had to sort of be involved in social activity because of other reasons. The military, because they had to guide these people to death in war, and the clergy to uh, exercise religious services from cradle to death. And they had to be well embedded in society as well. And a, a big clash involving everybody emerged under these circumstances. However, Turkish secularization, on which I will talk in greater detail tomorrow, is specifically different from the European secularization. European secularization occurred almost simultaneously and due to a change in mentality which was brought about by reformation and enlightenment, which bypassed the Ottomans or Ottomans bypassed it. No enlightenment or reformation took place in the Ottoman Empire. There is no similarity between anything that Protestantism created in the 16th century as a new challenge to the Roman Catholic Church and provided for comprehensible religion seems to be occurring under similar circumstances in Turkey. Still, we do not have any strong movement that is pushing to understand the Holy Quran in its message. And although it's been translated into Turkish, 
a great effort and instructing it in Turkish seems to exist. So no similarity between the two, so far as philosophical currents are concerned. There's no philosophical depth here that existed in the realm of European states. It's a big, big difference. And whatever happened in the Ottoman Empire did not coincide with industrialization until very recently. Secularization then became reinforced after industrialization where Reformation and Enlightenment took root and became increasingly integrated into the Industrial Revolution at the same time. Nothing of the sort occurred in the Ottoman Empire. So there are very important differences in between that you have to take, think along. Um, take into consideration these lines of thinking um, and accept the fact that we're talking about something similar, but they're not identical. Secularization here and secularization in the North American, Western European sense of the term are not necessarily similar. Okay, last session we talked about the characteristic of change in the Ottoman Empire throughout the 18th and 19th centuries which brought about some form of modernization, though the success of the political modernization of the system was at most mixed. There had been many setbacks and failures of the performance of the military. The economy collapsed and uh, by the 1880s, the Ottomans were in a state of economic decline again, and they had to declare bankruptcy at some point, and therefore they became a country that had declared moratorium and couldn't pay their debt. Uh, however, at the same time, there have been some changes through the introduction of a constitution, although it was just a translation more or less of the Belgian constitution of the time, establishment of a legislature, some form of local and national level political representation, participation in politics increase with political parties and various organizations in the forms of interest groups, legal and illegal mushroomed, and the society moved towards mass politics to a certain extent, where certain rights were recognized by the Sultan, the old form of patrimonialism declined for a while until the Russo-Ottoman War of 1877-78 when the Sultan at the helm of government then, Abdul Hamid II, suspended the constitution and the operations of the Ottoman Mejlis, the legislature, for approximately 30 years. And uh, Ottomans went back to a state of absolutist rule by the Sultan, which this time was not legal, but may have been recognized as somewhat legitimate by large swaths of the population who had believed that this sultan was in a position to deliver them some benefits in this environment and provided them with a sense of security. After the war with Russia, they had no war except for in 1897, a war with Greece, which the Ottoman troops performed relatively well until 1912 when he had already been um, toppled by 1909. And he had brought in large groups of religious brotherhood from various parts of the empire, or even important some of them from parts of Africa, such as the Tijani movement, which became very strong and very influential at the time. And <coughs> he ruled with the support of these 
religious orders, which seem to have provided him with considerable amount of political legitimacy in the eyes of the people through his religiosity. So the conservative masses seem to have approved of this style of rule where religion was mixed with some form of heavy-handed absolutism. But this was also a period in which the constitution was sidelined. Baba Ali, the uh, port, the sublime port, where the government operated routinely, was bypassed on most critical matters of the state. The Sultan ruled almost alone in his palace at the top of a hill called Yildiz, where there is a Yildiz Technical University now. If you visit the university, you'll see some of the buildings of the palace. Removed from the shore to ensure that the Navy does not carry out a military coup against him. He ruled in a state of paranoia with his cronies and a form of rule by cronyism in an absolutist form in a patrimonial absolutist style again emerged for the last time in the Ottoman Empire until 1908. But in this period he had also introduced new educational institutions and provided for science education, enlarged the number of students receiving science education and natural sciences also advanced, which created a totally unexpected outcome of producing a relatively well-educated group of people who believe that a good society is established around the idea of progress, science, and what they produce together, rational thinking. As the core values of one impression of good society, which was pitted against another image of good society based on tradition, religion, and conservative customary way of life. Values that had been in vogue in the past, especially. A golden past known in Turkish as Asr Saadet, you know, epoch of felicity, so to speak. So the two completely diverged and clashed, mostly over educational policy as well, creating a situation which was not too alien at that time in Germany also, where there was also a Kulturkampf. And there was another Kulturkampf between these two clashing each other. This is something we have inherited. We're still living through it. And Turkey is still clashing over these two sets of values. Again, the, the one at the bottom are deeply believed and cherished by a majority. If our surveys are correct, roughly around 60% to 65% of the population versus 30-35% believing in the former. The, the top part, that is the science as good basis of good society versus religion as basis of good society. And these two completely contrasting images are there. But in this process of change, something occurred by default, which I'm tempted to call secularization. Becoming less embedded in sacred, thinking of the sacred, less embedded in religious dogma, and more living in the mundane and vulgar concerns of this worldly activity. That's what I'll call 
roughly secularism. And my um, understanding of this comes from this definition made by uh, a French colleague, Olivier Roy. Secularism confronts Islam is the name of his book, if you're interested in this sort of thing, especially secularism role in the 21st century, uh, not only in Turkey, but also in Europe. I highly adv advise you that you read his book carefully. Um, he defines the French, which is probably a Roman Catholic understanding of secularism, in which there is a strict separation of church and state. Which is in the French experience is known as laïcité. And this understanding was obviously learned and to a certain extent liked by those who were progressive minded members of the power elite who became ascendant after 1908. And they more or less adopted this understanding of separation of religious activity and the religious institution from the affairs of the state. Which was not totally possible and not necessarily very successful. But there was no church. There is no church in Turkey. And there can be no church in Sunni Islam. Actually, the Sunni understanding of Islam, the orthodoxy, where Islam, I should also inform you, is divided so far as its theological perspective is concerned, as well as its legal perspective is concerned, which concerns us, political scientists, the legal aspects, is divided into two major sects, but there are many more. But these are more important, the Orthodox Sunni sect, and the Shia or Shiite sect. Shia in Arabic means party. And this was originally used to refer to those who followed and supported Prophet Muhammad's son-in-law and his nephew, Ali. Hazrat Ali, we call it in Turkish, because he's one of the most veneered, uh, sacred, and close to religious charisma of the Prophet. And the Shiites believe that the charisma of the Prophet is routinized in Ali and his followers for they were the ones who came from the same genealogy as the Prophet. Closest genealogy, closest blood tie to the Prophet. And <coughs> therefore those who believe that he should be the ruler of the religious community upon the death of Prophet Hazrat Muhammad supported his claim to caliphate, to be the caliph in the absence of the Prophet. And they were referred to as Shiat Ali, Ali's party. And their name became the Shia or Shi'i or Shiite sometimes in, in English. Whereas the others who believed in the orthodoxy mainly assumed that those learned men who had been with the Prophet from the very beginning who are again respected a lot, who are also believed to have the correct vision of both on theological and legal and political grounds should rule in the absence of the prophet upon his death in his place. And these became um, more numerous, more influential, and the fight between the two more or less determined the outcome of the settlement and the demographic picture of the Middle East up until now, which is now changing very, in, a, in a very interesting way. Sunnis have had four different schools of religion. <coughs> 
that coincided with law. Different interpretations of Islamic law. These are schools of law or fiqh or fiqh in Turkish. Hanbali, Maliki, Shafi, and Hanafi. Then there is also a third very influential sect, but a, definitely a minority position, who argued that this fight between the two is actually an act of heresy. They walked out of religion. This is irreligious. And they stayed out of this fight. They called themselves Hawarij. Harij in Arabic means outside. And it's also used in Turkish. So the Hawarij was the third group and actually fought both of them by sword. And they were prosecuted and persecuted by both. And they were pretty much eliminated from the picture. And they took refuge in the least habitable parts of the Arabian Peninsula, in parts of Yemen, also in northern parts of Iran for a while. And uh, their role dwindled over, over time, mainly. Now, among these four, Imam Hanbal, these are the names of the Imams, scholars, who established the religious law. Hanbal, Malik, Shafi, and Hanifi. These three are relatively more orthodox. And Hanifis are relatively less orthodox. Probably closer to Shi'i thinking to a certain extent as well. Though there is no question that they are part of the Sunnah. Of these three, another characteristic that ties them together that they are all Arabs. Whereas the Imam Hanafi, his name was Numan, an Iranian by birth. And he began his practice in Iran and became influential in Iran. Now, Ottoman caliphs or, or sultans have been Hanafis, especially after the 15th century. The records of what they were or who they were is not very clear in the very beginning. Um, for a while, they might have been more influenced by Shiism. And in the 13th and 14th centuries, Shiism and Sunnism seem to be rubbing shoulders in Anatolia, to a great extent. And in fact, it was one of those leaders of a tribe, Shah Ismail, later on, was Sheikh Ismail, again, a religious figure, once upon a time, became influential in Iran and became um, the Shah of Iran, and was instrumental in introducing Shiism into Iran to a great extent. Previously, Sunnism was also ascendant in, in Iran, especially when the Turkish tribes moved through Iran from Central Asia and walked into Anatolia. So they were deeply influenced by Sunnism as well. So it was a mixture. But eventually, the Ottoman sultans decided on becoming Hanafis. So most Turks are Hanafis because of that connection. The role and importance of these religious Splits became less important in the modern Turkish history after the Republic and therefore it's not very well known in Turkish society today. When you ask the mess up of people, most people can't tell it today. In surveys we ask them, you know, are you religious? Okay. Are you Sunni? What is your mess up? Many, many people say, Alhamdulillah, Mr. which doesn't mean anything. It's gone, pretty much. And that probably provides the possibility of more orthodox form of thinking, such as Hanbalism, to take some hold among Turks today, which otherwise would have been much more difficult with 
strong Hanafi religious practices intact with Hanafi scholars defending their turf, this would have been very much difficult. And in fact, when Hanbalism turned more radical in the 18th century by the establishment of Wahhabism, which came out of Hanbali Islam, established by a scholar, again, Abdul Wahhab, in what is now central Saudi Arabia, which was then more or less desert, not controlled by the Ottomans, Ottomans prosecuted him, fought him, and eventually was the armies of Ibrahim Pasha who defeated the Ottoman armies, who also defeated, in the name of the Ottomans, Saudi armies under the command of Saudi family, captured some of the Saudi members and sent them to Istanbul. They were tried, found in treason and hanged by the Ottoman Empire. So there is little love lost between the Ottomans and the Saudis because of this connection, between the connection of the Saudis and the connection of the Ottoman Padishah. If there is a claim to caliphate, I'm sure the first to object to it would be the Saudis, right today, right now, because of that history. They don't look eye to eye on religious matters with the Ottoman family. And there is no, as far as I know, claim by the Ottoman family for the caliphate after it was abolished in 1924. So under these circumstances, there are important differences and they are not only theological differences, but they're also legal and political differences. And politics can be very bloody so far as these relations are concerned and have been so. Except for the first caliph, all three others had been assassinated, especially during prayer, which is another indication that assassination played a major role in the political history of Islam. Not so much in religion, but in politics. Yes. Yes, sir. Maybe it's not relevant for now, but uh, they were linked one of those uh, groups to ISIS of today, the extreme. Closest that comes to ISIS is probably Wahhabism. Probably. As far as I know, and I don't know much, they have 12 judges in Mosul who are passing judgment on what to do with some of these um, hostages and um, decide to execute them or, or no. All 12 are from Saudi Arabia, if the international press is correct. I haven't met them, I haven't seen them, I haven't asked them, so I don't know whether that is true or not. But they are all operating within Wahhabi interpretation of fiqh for the time being. So there seems to be such a connection as such. <clears throat> this is very puritanical in its orientation and very orthodox in its interpretations of the law. Not so far as the others are concerned. Maliki, Islam and law is practiced in Morocco mainly, Shafi mainly among the Kurds in Turkey, and Hanafi Islam, rest of the Arab world also, uh, to a great extent, among Sunni Iranians and most Sunni Turks at the same time. But there are different practices as well. And there are big differences in the way they interpreted the law and implemented it. For example, um, there had not been any amputations of hands of thieves during the Ottoman period, in spite of the fact that in the Holy Quran it says very clearly that if you catch a thief, you should remove the limb that had been used in the theft. Never practiced it. And the Ottomans, of course, in the 19th century, as with most other countries, completely um, outlawed slavery as well. And, it, and also today, slavery is not considered as a practice that can be condoned by Turkish law or for that matter, any of that law. So there have been various differences of interpretations in most such matters at the same time. There has also been a major move towards 
monogamistic practices in the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century. Most families, when they go back into Ottoman period, especially in Istanbul, in the center, has had, had been practicing monogamy. Although polygamy is possible, according to the religious interpretations, up to four wives at any point in time per man. Which practically means, if you can get divorced, many more than four wives in some practices. And the sultans in the Ottoman Empire and also various other rulers throughout the Middle East had practiced this more lavishly. For example, in more recent times, King Abdulaziz of Saudi Arabia, when he died in uh, the 20th century after he had established Saudi Arabia in 1932, has 150 wives, for example. And most of those were not romantic affairs, to tell you the truth, but all of them were political. He married into every tribe to provide some kind of coalition that would hold the um, kingdom together. Similar practices had occurred in the Ottoman period as well. Such practices had also been practiced um, in various fixed marriages between empires in Europe and elsewhere at the same time. So marriage is one way of, in politics that is, is one way of establishing some kind of alliance between different families or dynasties or different, between different tribes. And not necessarily what you and I understand of marriage today, a love affair. There's very lo little love in it. There's a lot of politics at that level when you're a king, so to speak. <clears throat> now, none of these schools assume that they hold anything special in the relation between man and God. You're supposed to read the Quran, understand the Quran, practice the Quran on your own, and then be responsible for it in the afterlife. So that sounds not very communitarian in practice. And the clergy has little room to play. Though you can ask counsel from more learned people about a certain practice. About whether you can have divorce, whether you should be paying back some kind of interest on the loan you got, etc. This is possible, but you can decide on your own. And therefore, there is no institution or a class established between men, women, and God in the Sunni interpretation. In the Shiism, since there is charisma, and the charisma is practiced in the genealogy of the prophet and his son-in-law and their offsprings, 12 imams, some believe in five, some seven, some 12, all descendants. There is a special connection through them to God. And they can provide interpretation with the same authority of, of the prophet, almost, in his absence. And truly represent, in that sense, the authority left behind by the prophet. And practice it. And act as interpreters. Mujtahid. Which, according to the Sunni tradition, continued until about the 10th century and has not been practiced ever since. And it's known as the door of interpretation. Baba Ijtihad is closed for the Sunnis. No new interpretation is acceptable under these circumstances of, the, um, of these different legal systems under these circumstances. So there are legal differences, important legal differences, which lead to different practices. So there is something like a church in Shiism but none in Sunni. In Sunni practice, the religious clergy are state employees and have always been so. And therefore they have been controlled, manipulated, pressured by the state elites very easily. As I have told you already, there have been instances where they were sacked or even executed by the sultans as such. So they don't hold a very special um, Position. However, as Qadis, 
and also as imam. They had been with the people from the very beginning and they had played a major role in their societies. They lived with them. They suffered with them. They saw their sufferings. They sometimes took advantage of these people, exploited them. Sometimes they defended them. There have been many different kinds of cutters involved in many different practices. But especially when the state started to decompose in the 19th century, especially these religious figures started to emerge as the leaders in localities of these people, protecting them against the wrath of the center, and therefore promoted their interests and protected their interests and fought with them under these circumstances. And they then become integral part of mass politics in the 19th century as society became increasingly involved in mass, mass politics in the Ottoman Empire as well. Especially after the first constitutional period, definitely after the second constitutional period. And they also played a major role during the War of Liberation, fighting on both sides of the divide under these circumstances. So, separating the state and church is not that easy under these circumstances. We don't know where one begins and the other ends. Whereas it's much easier in the Roman Catholic Church. You know where the state is, Vatican, and where the church is, Vatican. And if in your country Vatican is represented by a church, you know who to blame, who to address, has a postal code, email address, fax number, telephone number, you can call up and say, hey, you stand behind this line. And that is possible. Not in the Turkish case or wherever Sunni Islam is in practice in those societies. Such a division is very, very difficult. Because it's a direct connection between the individual and God. And there's very little room that you can intervene through the establishment of a clerical upper class or a clerical institution that speaks for the religious dogma and practices it. So, separation, state and church, fine, but here, separation of the institutions was to a certain extent practice, pushed back in the 19th century, especially out of education and the legal system. And in that sense, both became less religious and more scientific and uh, mundane, this worldly instead of otherworldly, which secularism actually means, where concerns of religion and the otherworldly concerns play relatively less role in the decision making process of the individuals at the same time. And that has happened in the um, Ottoman realm, also eventually in the Turkish realm. But the institutions, Baba Meshihat, Sheikh al-Islamlik and, and the rest of them were abolished very easily. And they were brought into the fold of the state system by the establishment of religious affairs. Diyanet Ishleri. Diyanet is a plural word. It's a plural word. It means religions. and was given a place within the state personnel administration and also it became part and parcel of the um, ministerial organization of the state and had been assigned to a state minister in charge of religious affairs from 1920s onwards. However, that didn't make it a separate institution. It opened it up for manipulation, pressure, going in both directions. State agents pressuring them and them pressuring the state agents. But, and also a subject of control by the state to a great extent. But did not create it as a church in the sense that it has its own subsidiarity where matters of religion was assigned to it exclusively as, as such. And not all religions were also represented effectively in the Ayat Ishtar It was mostly the affairs of Sunni Muslims. 
and more recent times, non-Sunni Muslims, Alevis, have been pressuring their politicians to make room for them in this organization as well. And that's, that is a major bone of contention, a big political football now that is conti continuously pushed back and forth. And there have been many efforts in various governments to look into this matter, including the current one, or the previous governments by the Justice and Development Party, with no success whatsoever. So these matters are unsettled. And of course, because of this nature of this plasticity of institutional characteristic of Islam in the Turkish practice, this principle sounds nice, separation of church and state. It's in practice, it's enormously difficult to implement in most occasions. So what it becomes in the Turkish practice of laiklik, so laicite now becomes laiklik, liberation of the individual mind from the restraints imposed by traditional Islamic concepts and practices and modernizations of all aspects of the state and society that have been molded by Islamic traditions and ways. Leave the traditional Islamic conservative baggage of values completely and in their place develop new set of values and practice them as individuals. Free individuals with free will and much again uh, depends on what you understand from free will, freedom of the individual and how much you value that freedom as such. As we will see there is not much support for this idea of freedom in Turkish society and not much demand for it either. Not for individual freedom. There is an inclination for arbitrariness, which is not freedom, but there is no major inclination for being free as such by the individuals. Uh, free of state intervention. And in fact, many people yearn for some kind of state intervention in their lives. Just to give you a little snippet, about five years ago, a colleague in public health, professor, who did a survey announced the results. I don't know whether she presented it this way or the journalist understood it this way. I don't know. But the argument was that in this survey, they asked many questions, and they, the kind of information they got on one was to seem to have insinuated or indicated clearly that people argued that they hoped that the state would find a way of making cigarette smoking impossible in the living rooms of their houses. If you don't want your visitors, relatives, friends, husband, wife, whatever, smoke in your living room, you tell them. How is the state going to interfere in this? It's amazing. They expect the state come and interfere in their living room, stop people from smoking cigarettes. And declare it as illegal, and find them. I found this idea absurd. Absurd even in a society that may not be democratic, but yearning for democracy. If you believe that the state plays some role in your living rooms, you can never become Democrats. Never. That's the end of it. State has no room in my home stays out of the door. The minute it gets into the door, through the door, it's totalitarianism. A demand for state of that nature is problematic for the Turkish culture, if this finding is true. I don't know whether this is true or not. It can be lousy measurement. So, that is the problem. There is a a lot of problem with the way freedom is understood and practiced under these circumstances. And uh, we will look 
more closely into that in the future. But the idea is about liberating the mind of the individual. People with free opinions, free views, free education, educating themselves freely in the realm that they want to be educated. Free conscience. Again, a poet from the Ottoman period, Fikret. Fikrehür, irfanehür, vicdanehür. That's the formulation. Free idea, free opinion, free education, free enlightenment, actually, and free conscience. That was more or less the combination that he was sort of airing against Abdul Hamid II's rule, which he considered as tyrannical. It was authoritarian, definitely. And um, he didn't have much tolerance for opposition of any kind or criticism of any kind. There was strong censorship of the press then. There was no other media, therefore press censorship was immaculate. So, creating these kinds of individuals with free minds, free conscience, free enlightenment. How to do that? And most of it involves education, obviously. And there has been a lot of storms going about the education, the content, the subject matter of education, how it is taught, who it is taught, and how people are approached. And getting rid of traditional Islamic concepts and practices always involved all sorts of cultural symbolism. What we say and we do is culture, but what we say and do is always involved in some form of symbolic gestures and involves attitude, attire, what we wear, garment, that we brandish on ourselves. And there have been, always been, great problems involved in that. What looks like ridiculous in some other circumstances becomes a burning issue in the Turkish practice. It was Mahmoud II, the first modernizer in the Ottoman Empire, who introduced the Fez, which tourists love still. Wherever they go, they get a Fez. As you may have noticed by now, that most people don't, go, don't wear the Fez. It's out of fashion. There is no one pushing for the Fez any longer. Uh, the turban is a different method. That's a religious symbol, um, starkly religious, and most believe that they should don it if they believe that they are religiously learned. It's a different matter. But the Fez is gone. Many people resisted wearing the Fez, taking out their turbans and wearing the Fez at the time. I'm talking about 1830s. About 100 years later, 1925, this time, hat was introduced for men instead of the Fez. Those who wouldn't be caught dead with a hat on their head wouldn't leave their homes in reaction to all of that. So what is in a fez, or a hat, or a turban? You know, you may think, well, it symbolizes lifestyle, values. Where do you stand in that divide? Whole sets of baggage. And it's given a sense of the sacred, which is not very religious. Look at Ra's definition. It says, the emancipation of the society from a sense of the sacred. Not getting rid of the sacred, but emancipation of it from a sense of the sacred. And you don't operate with sacred playing a role in your mind by reference to it all the time. Sacred exists, but many sacreds perhaps, not one. Different people have different sacreds. And these all tolerated at the same time, have the same legitimacy, cherished at the same time. Now this reflects a certain 
historical evolution, a certain process and a certain procession of historical phenomena which more or less built up a certain political structure which is quite a bit different from country to country and in the Turkish case also the kind of secularism that emerged by pushing the religious institutions powers in the 19th century by modernization and bringing in new education providing room for the Muslims to go for positions of power by getting the right kind of education, attend schools like Galatasaray, Lisesi, etc. Sultani schools and what have you, learn French practice French, learn science, work as engineers and what have you and come to positions of power in the Ottoman system and be somebody and therefore they became increasingly attracted to this new type of education and shunned away from religious education which the best and the brightest had been enrolled in at earlier times and that diminished the power of the religious clergy and the religious establishment and this happened for all kinds of religions in the Ottoman Empire including the Muslims however this form of secularization by default seemed to have been different from secularization that occurred in Europe first of all as you very well know there was the reinterpretation of the religious dogma in most places in Europe which provided for the emergence of different religious institutions, different churches some kind of um, reaction to Roman Catholic standards by the 16th century Protestantism started to take hold in not only Switzerland but also in Germany and elsewhere and large swaths of people started to convert eventually Pope was seen increasingly as a head of state just a political figure among other political figures in Europe therefore it was possible for Henry VIII to confiscate whatever the Catholic Church had in Britain in the name of providing more funds for the Navy and the Army which the British needed to protect their land and eventually establish their empire and therefore the Roman Catholics met a big challenge by the establishment of the Anglican Church which became a state church all of this now became possible and he could be the Pope could be pushed back politically but at the same time through reformation and enlightenment a philosophical change in mentality seemed to have taken root in the European continent to the west of the Ottoman Empire which did not happen in the Ottoman Empire there was no theological grounds for moving into the realm of politics through the door of the churches to push back the influence of an established church in the form of Roman Catholic Church was pushed back by other churches and then by other heads of state, kings and what have you in their fights with the Roman Catholic Church and Roman Catholic Church had armies fought in battles, assassinated people you know, poisoned them and whatever and they were poisoned back etc. It was a dirty political game played throughout the continent. Nothing of the sort seemed to have happened in the Ottoman Empire. So no experience with the Reformation, no experience with Enlightenment under those circumstances. So the two histories are different. So many churches and clashes of churches led to some kind of an impasse. There have been many bloody wars throughout Europe for 30 years, 100 years. In practice they lasted for about 300 they discovered that they couldn't get rid of each other by war so eventually they started to develop some kind of understanding of coexistence and eventually the religious tolerance that different opinions can live together side by side all of them would be legitimate they will have their own proselytizing to do if they convince others to turn to them it's fine but there will be 
some kind of tolerance and toleration for the other, which never happened in the Ottoman Empire. In fact, opposition began to emerge only in the 20th century with enormous difficulty, very little legitimacy. And we still today in Turkish politics hear politicians accused of each, each other of treason. You know. Now, most recently in Scotland, they went through a referendum on secession. How many politicians have been accused of treason in Scotland? by the British establishment. I haven't heard the word. If we'll go through some motion of similar nature, the word treason will be flying about all the places in Turkey all of the time, I'm, I'm sure. Even now, not a week passes, not say a day, that the government argues that opposition is in treason and the Opposition argues that the government is in treason. Vatana ihanet, all the time. Which means that the opposition is not legitimate. It's not legal. Whereas, in the example that I've given to you, it's a choice given to people. They either choose yes or no. If they choose no, they go their own way, suffer the consequences. If chip, if they choose yes, they go their old way and suffer the consequences, whatever they may be. That's it. It's as simple as that. Nothing that is seen as an act of treason by anyone. So, losers then can live with the winners under those circumstances. Not in the Turkish case. Losers are out, cast aside stigmatized and accused with heinous acts and looked down upon, which enables or disables opposition from becoming effective under most circumstances anyway. So, no practice of enlightenment, no practice of reformation. Ottomans did not go through the motions of industrial revolution. There was no economic change from a rural agricultural economy to an urban industrial one. And that started to occur in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, especially 80s. Most recently, way after the Ottoman Empire. And therefore, Europeans also went through from the 16th century onwards, some of them in the 16th, began this process, and the Industrial Revolution was ushered in in the 17th century, and then some joined in this as late as 19th century, perhaps, but eventually all of Europe went through this process of transforming their societies from rural agricultural to urban industrial, with a larger proportion of the population being employed in the, in the industry, and the feudal lords gave way to the bourgeois entrepreneurs, capitalists, who started to wield real power and lock into fight with the proletariat, workers. And the workers were able to push their way into politics by gaining representation in the parliaments in the 19th and the 20th century as such. And the same kind of give and take took place, as had been the case with the churches, religion, and what have you, in these rural, urban, and middle class, lower class, or labor class interactions. And they sort of included large groups of people. The society became more inclusive as large swaths of the population. A huge majority began to take place in the politics of decision making in the legislatures of these countries in the 19th and the 20th century, which pushed for a sort of increasing um, tolerance for differences, pluralism of various sorts, where a plurality of people could now survive and live together and enjoy the fruits of industrial revolution in their urban societies. 
So, there have been these various clashes which are resolved by greater inclusivity of these newer groups into society which continued on in the 20th century with women and now various um, outcast and marginalized groups are coming into the limelight of politics in Europe today and the process is still con continuing after some struggle there seems to be some kind of inclusion of larger groups of people still tolerance of dissent different lifestyles and a plurality of lifestyles all accepted as legitimate continuing and creating circumstances for coexisting, living together under these circumstances. Now in the Ottoman Empire there was one major clash between the powerful center and the periphery. A homogenous center, all powerful, removed from the rest of the society, looked down upon it, had its own standards, language, tastes, for music, poetry, literature, art, distinctly different from that of the people. Those of you who have had Ottoman Turkish literature should recall the kind of different styles of poetry of the folk versus the palace. Different styles of music enjoyed by them. Different food enjoyed by them. Um, which the masses could not afford, of course, much food in comparison to the palace, which the palace was able to excel, develop and create a cuisine of its own. And therefore it has a relatively tasty, nice assortment of different dishes which can be produced. Most of it is carried on to the Republican era, but I'm, I'm sure some of them are lost. Uh, most of them are not very healthy, so I'm not suggesting that they were any superior in that sense of the term. Full of lard, uh, animal uh, fat, that is. Um, sugar, lots of it, increasingly refined and all that. Obviously, uh, is not good for you, especially if you have a sedentary lifestyle. Many of the sultans were immensely overweight, especially at their later ages, if they survived, uh, became obese. So under these circumstances, you can argue that different lifestyles of the center, which also controlled all power versus this relatively powerless, heterogeneous, culturally mixed periphery, living in a rural environment of nomads and some small farmers or farmers operating in larger agricultural estates uh, provided one major clash between these two realms of life. And this was sort of a competition between different understanding not only of lifestyles but of civilization. Those of you who are interested in understanding this kind of interaction should read Ibn Khaldun's Muqaddimah. It's an introduction to sociology written by a North African or we can put a K to make it sound more Arabic. The name is Muqaddimah, which means introduction. If I'm not mistaken, it's a huge book. He couldn't write the rest, but that, the introduction itself was immense. And where he talks about this clash between the people of the desert who live in this rough, natural 
environment who are not necessarily, according to his understanding, very civilized, but have a very strong metal, which he defines as asabiya. Uh, and they live in solidarity, and they are ready to take any challenge from any enemy. And when they move against the established cities of northern Africa, they come like locusts and no army can stop them. And they go over these cities, level them completely, and that is the end of the civilization of that city as it had existed up until that time. Then these people settle there, and by settling there and starting living in the urban environment, they become civilized but also mellow. They lose their asabiya. Few generations, they create a huge civilization which now becomes ripe for another major attack from the desert and there, therefore life goes on in cycles. There is no progress, there is no decay. Life is a cycle. A clash between civilized urban centers and a non-civilized desert people, nomads. And it's in that balance that the life exists. There's not that much of a difference between the understanding of the Ottoman situation to a certain extent. There are parallels in that, and this clash does not lead to any kind of room for coexistence. A pluralistic understanding of life in which different lifestyles can exist, not dominated from a center, and a center that is at ease with its own people, not observing it with vigilance and trepidation, that at some point in time they'll rise up against them and then attack them and get rid of them in total. So it's a center that is tremendously paranoid in its attitude towards the people. It sees the people as a cauldron of rebellion, simmering, waiting to rise up and end civilization in Constantinople or Istanbul, the capital, some point in time, protecting them, those who live in the capital, against this kind of uncivilized mob then becomes a basic vision. So a opposition representing this mob is something that is neither legitimate nor acceptable. So under these circumstances it became increasingly difficult to place secularism as part of this modernizing process so smoothly as such. Until the Republic, which changed a lot of this and which was established after a war of liberation. We sometimes call it an independence war, but it was not. For the Ottomans, although had become economically exploited and dependent upon Europeans, especially the British and the French, to a certain extent Russians and, and also the Austrians to a certain extent, but they were not colonized in the strict sense of the term. At the end of the First World War, the Ottoman Empire collapsed just like the others. They had come under the rule of a nationalist or Turkish nationalist group by 1913, who had served in the military and came to rule the country by a military coup, which they effected in 1913. And these people had been trained by the German officers after Germany beat France in 1870. The Ottomans concluded that now they discovered the Immaculate Army, German Army. Uh, and they changed sides, sacked most of the French officers, and invited the German officer corps to train them in martial sciences and arts, which they did. It also 
fitted into the designs of the German government at the time, which was also trying to expand into the part of the world that the Ottomans ruled. So they started to establish some kind of collusion or alliance with the German government uh, after 1880s. And Germans were uh, influential in building a railroad from the northern parts of the empire into Hejaz, to the south. And they were also instrumental in providing uh, some kind of assistance to the Ottomans in trying to develop their brand of industry to a certain extent. But military aid was the most important and critical. Now, at the very beginning of the war, Ottomans declared neutrality. However, Germany wanted to get the Ottomans on their side so that the Russian, British, and French cooperation and coordination could be somehow hindered or severed by the Ottomans being in between controlling Eastern Mediterranean and the Black Sea. That would make things easier for the German war effort at the time. So when two of their ships, Goeben and Breslau, were involved in some kind of a problem in around Italy, they asked for protection from the Ottomans and the Ottomans gave them the protection. They changed the names of Goeben and Breslau Yavuz and Midilli, Turkish. Though all the command and the soldiers in it were German troops. They got through the Bosphorus, although the British and the French were furious about this, which they believed did not necessarily coincide with neutrality of the Ottoman Empire. They sailed closer to Russia and bombed the port cities of Russia and the Black Sea. On November the 1st, 1914, Russia declared war on the Ottoman Empire again. <coughs> In the meantime, on the 1st of August, a clandestine treaty was established between the Ottoman Empire and Germany of 1914, 1st of August, which established a Turkish-German alliance against Russia. The Ottoman government was hoping that they would be able to get some of their territory that they had lost during the Balkan War back at the end of the war. And some of them were hoping that they could also get some of the Central Asian territory recently conquered after 1860s by the Russians under Ottoman rule or unite with them and create a larger Turkic empire that extended from the Balkans through the Black Sea Caucasus, Central Asia, all the way to China. The name of this was called Turan. And it was a major goal of the ethnic Turkish nationalists who had migrated from Russia, and they have been influential in creating this idea that this is possible, and a larger Turan could be established, a grand Turkish Empire could stretch again from Eastern Europe to Western China. And they would become more powerful with German help. And at the same time get, get rid of these debt problems and get them cleared from their account books. And also the capitulations which were 
restricting the capability of the Ottomans to increase their economic power could now be rescinded if this were successful, if they were successful at the end of the war. In February 1915, the Allies attacked the Straits. Both the British and the French Navy attacked the Straits and they assumed that they could go through the Dardanelles without much of a problem. They were wrong. The Straits were mined very meticulously and several ships were fatally wounded and sank and they had to pull back. However, the attack on Dardanelles continued until 9th of January 1916. It's one of the, again, more major involvement of troops and a big slaughter on both sides. Many lost their lives. The military losses of the Ottoman Empire was about 60,000 people, anywhere between 50 to 60,000. It, it was approximately five to six times that on the sides of those who attacked Dardanelles. About the same time in 1915, Ottomans also attacked across the Sinai and Gaza to the Suez Canal, which had been under British control. Um, however, the British fortifications were pretty strong, just like the Ottoman fortifications in Dardanelles. Uh, they were butchered. Many of, them, many of them were sitting ducks in boats, dinky boats going across um, the Suez Canal. So the machine gun fire slaughtered them all. They had to pull back. And then came, more or less the same time, the disaster of Sarikamish, where the Ottoman troops were used under heavy snow, December 23rd through the 29th, 1914, to go through mountain ranges and go beyond the Russian lines and put a siege on the Russian troops, sandwiching them between different army corps. It was a rotten idea, simply because they didn't have the necessary equipment to run such a project in the middle of winter. Two army corps, colored in Turkish, perished. Not because of Russian fire, they froze to death. They couldn't make it. Too cold. They all died of cold, not war. And the Third Army pulled back on January 6, 1915. However, its defenses was deeply battered. And soon after, Russians were in a position to walk easily further south to one, capture it. By which time, one had been occupied and cleansed from the Muslim population by the Armenian brigands. 65,000 Muslims died in this process. From 1870s onwards, the Russians had been involved in creating some kind of irredentist policy in eastern parts of Anatolia to invade those parts and then go down to Kilikia, which is near Adana. This is the area near Adana and Mersin, and establish a warm water port for Russia. And they were using the solidarity with the Armenians to do this as much as possible. Although Armenians have played some role in the Sarikamish disaster, Enver Pasha, the major general in charge of that operation, it was his great idea. Blame the Armenians for it which resulted in a policy of 
internally resettling the Armenians, called Tehcir, in the spring of 1915. Many died in the process. Some had been slaughtered. Some passed away as they walked from parts of eastern Anatolia without any proper roads to the south. Some of them were settled in Syria, or what was the Syrian provinces of the Ottoman Empire, mostly in Deir Ezzur. Deir Ezzur is now, today, is a town you hear from time to time in the war in Syria and around that area. But soon after, the Ottomans were able to regain some of their lost territory in eastern Anatolia and were able to create a sort of a balance between their troops and the Russian troops. In 1917, the Russian Revolution came to their help. The Russian army collapsed. All of a sudden, Turan became a possibility. They perished. The Caucasus <coughs> had no armed forces protecting them against the onslaught of the Ottoman army. So they moved in that direction and met with the British army eventually. So they were stopped there to a certain extent. But the campaign of the British army, what was to become the Middle East, was very effective. And in 1916 and 17, uh, the British army was able to def defeat the Ottoman army in what is known as Palestine, mainly. And the Palestinian Arabs fought on the side of the British against the Ottomans, which created in the minds of the soldiers who went from Anatolia and served there, that Arabs are traitors. They hit us in the back, they argued. Well, they had established a new alliance with the British. Sheriff Hussein of Hejaz and McMahon. McMahon was the um, British ambassador to Cairo had established some contact, and the British offered Sheriff Hussein to be the king of Arabia from the Atlantic Ocean to the Indian Ocean. Vague references, etc. He believed in that, and he started to fight against the Ottomans effectively. Many suffered in the hands, and that had created, in the generation who fought, my sort of grandfather's generation, not father's generation, um, those who had fought in the, in the ranks of the Ottoman army had a very, very dismal uh, idea of Arabs as a result of what they had experienced in Palestine. You may consider that what is known as Palestine, Gaza, basically Israel today to a great extent, is where the Ottoman end, Empire ended, militarily. That's it. Um, second army was pulled back. There was a new um, arrangement of the troops and a new command under Lightning armies, as we may translate it into English, Yildirim Ordulare. And they tried to hold, fend off the British, push further north, somewhere in Syria, and northern Iraq. What is known as Mosul today was in the Ottoman hands when on the 30th of October 1918, in the port city of Mudros, in the Aegean island of Limni, an armistice treaty was signed between the Ottoman Empire and the British. And that 
more or less brought the end of the war, but it precipitated events which eventually led to the occupation of parts of Anatolia and partition of what was left of the Ottoman Empire eventually. Among the uh, winning powers of the First World War. Uh, I think I should put this. Now, This is the cartographic image of the Sevres Treaty signed on the 10th of August 1920 after a series of negotiations and many conferences which established a Greek zone, Italian zone, French zone, British zone and an Armenian zone for the Soviets were not given any um, land deal. They supported the nationalist forces resisting occupation. But the Armistice Treaty argued that there would be, the troops would be disbanded, their arms would be handed over, and to be able to do that, that there will be uh, some kind of organization to be carried out under these circumstances. This armistice treaty was negotiated such that if it were necessary, the victorious powers of the First World War would occupy any part of the Ottoman territory to dispel disorder, any kind of um, rebellious activity and what have you. But at the same time, in this armistice treaty, a definition of the, of the area was made, which then was used by the nationalists who won the elections to come to serve as the part of the Ottoman Mejlis and on 28 January 1920 they met and declared a national pact Misak Milli literally it means national pact in which they alluded to the Armistice Treaty and argued that the people who resided in territories under the Ottoman Empire, who spoke Turkish and Muslim, most, mostly Ottoman subject with Muslim extraction, are united in a way that they cannot be divisible. And argued that that territorial span is the homeland for these people. And on this homeland, they have the right to national self-determination, espousing the principles of President Wilson, which were very contemporary at the time. That is the basis of legitimacy for the rule that de eventually developed and had been developing in Anatolia as an alternative to the Sultan in Istanbul and as a resistance to occupation of various parts of the Anatolian landmass as I showed you on the map. <coughs> 
Before this period in time, the Greeks had established a foothold in and around Izmir or Smyrna region, this area here. But the Italians did not like the settlement. They believed that they were not given enough territory. So they pulled out of this deal early on, starting supporting the Turkish nationalists by providing them arms, also health care, and even education in parts of southern Anatolia, and also uh, help them throughout the resistance. So did the Soviet Union, assuming that this is a bourgeois nationalist revolution against imperialist capitalism of the time, began to support the Turkish nationalists. And also, the Indian Muslims, who were organizing among themselves, which eventually culminated in the establishment of Pakistan, as you very well know, contributed financial funds, gold coins, to the nationalists to resist the occupation by the Greeks. So, this major uh, resistance had become in this area in 1919. In 1920, as soon as this national pact was declared by the Mejdis, the British troops raided the Mejdis and closed it down. So the Ottoman government was left without a Mejdis. In the meantime, on the 15th of May, 1919, a general who had been very successful in the First World War, Dardanelles, had been commissioned by the Sultan to go to Anatolia to disband the military in an orderly fashion. General Mustafa Kemal had landed in Samsun, the city here, and moved in inwards, made a declaration in Amasya early on that the conditions of armistice and the peace in the offering is unacceptable and held two conferences, one at Erzurum, another in Sivas. When this decision of the British occupation of Istanbul with the dissolution of the parliament occurred on the 23rd of April 1920, he and those who supported him moved to Ankara to open up the Turkish Grand National Assembly to business. And therefore, practiced the right to self-determination through the efforts of a Grand National Assembly, which they argued legitimately represent the nation, has the national will supporting it, and it derives its legitimacy from the nation. So they provided an alternative definition of legitimacy. Not tradition, but nation. National will. And went through some motions, of course, not immaculate, of electing representatives, whoever they could. And some of them fled from Istanbul, came and joined them through Inabolu from Istanbul to Inabolu and then went down south to Ankara. And the National Assembly began to practice a form of government which is known as the Assembly Government in Turkey, Mejdis Hükümeti, and encapsulated all the powers of the state in that institutional format. So the Grand National Assembly now was the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary wrapped into one. 
In 1921, a constitution defined this unison of powers of the Grand National Assembly, that the Grand National Assembly was the assembly of the nation, representing the national will, and exercising their power on the basis of national will, and eventually established an army after several attempts that would be responsible to it to serve as a army of the nationalist forces, Kuwai Milie, to fend off the opposition and fight against the occupants. Now, there is a Western Front where fights occurred between the victorious powers of the First World War, Greeks, and they moved inwards all the way close to Ankara. They were stopped near this river, Sakarya, in 1922. And soon after, they were pushed back and defeated near Afyon and pulled out of Izmir and Bursa on the 9th and 13th of September 1922. That's front number one. Front number two is in the south against the French. They had moved in to control the cities of Antep, Marash, Urfa. All of them rose up against the French rule, mainly because the French decided to employ Armenians who had fled this area and they had a grudge against the Muslims. And that didn't play very well for these Armenians started to have a very heavy-handed way of managing the affairs of these cities, which precipitated rebellions in these cities, could not be contained by the French. And the, in 1921, the French mandate of Syria discovered that it cannot control these three cities and pulled out of it. And established a treaty in Ankara between the French government and the Ankara government not the Turkish government yet, which was obviously protested vehemently by the British, but the French pulled out of the war. And in the east, Armenian armies, for Armenia had become independent after the collapse of Russia and in the process of Soviet Union to be established, and wanted to secure this area under its own control and fought against the non-disbanded troops under the command of Kazim Karabekir, another general from the Ottoman army. Kazim Karabekir earlier accepted the command of Mustafa Kemal when he visited Erzurum, cooperated with him, and provided the bulk of the military that supported national resistance anyway. And in 1920, he was able to defeat in three battles the Armenian troops and move into the city of Gümrü. And in early December 1920, established the Armistice Treaty and demarcated the border between Turkey and Armenia in the Treaty of Gümrü which I can show you in French, but not, not in uh, English. These are the gentlemen who were part of this negotiation. Kazım Karabekir Pasha, Hamid Bey, Süleyman Necati Bey, who was a deputy from Erzurum, Governor General of Erzurum, Vali of Erzurum, and Kazım Karabekir Pasha, he was the commander of the Oriental Front as it was called in French, as opposed to Alexander Katasian and Abraham Kulhandian. Kulhandanian, I'm sorry. Um, both of them ex-ministers of the Armenian government, and they established that the war between Turkey and Armenia has finished. 
This is 2nd December, 1920. Okay? That's the end of animosities between Armenia and what is to become Turkey, or the Ottoman Empire, uh, the sort of successes of the Ottoman Empire at the time. Now, um, from then on, a couple of others, other treaties were established. The final one was signed in Kars. This is the Treaty of Kars. A large number of uh, Turkish and Armenian representatives established again the, the border. Um, various articles define the basis of relationship, etc. between the two, two countries, as many articles as you can see. And an earlier version of this was reiterated in the Treaty of Moscow, signed between the Ankara government and the Soviet Union. And by that time, in March 1921, Armenia had become a Soviet Republic. And therefore, they were represented accordingly. This, as you know, as you can see from here, more or less defines where the Armenian-Turkish frontier is. La frontière nord-est de la Turque, etc. explains you. It starts from the village of Sarp on the Karacha Shal Shalvar, I would assume. Uh, and then defines it, you know, it goes through this village, that village, uh, that mountain range, and this river, etc. And basically defines uh, this border. And uh, that more or less established this eastern border of Turkey, uh, which was renegotiated in Lausanne and established in Lausanne eventually in 1923. Then there was a fourth front, domestic front. The forces of the Sultan, who had signed a treaty in Sevres on 10th August 1920, had accepted that treaty and also the Armistice Treaty of Mudros in 1918, wanted to live according to those standards. For this was just another treaty that they had signed just like any other treaty they had signed in the 18th, 19th, 20th centuries earlier. What is the difference? And therefore, they tried to suppress the uprising, as they called it, Isyan. And there were 19 major attempts at that. None of them were successful. However, the Istanbul government used effectively those who were placed solidly within this image of good society and religion, effectively, to carry out their mobilizational efforts against the Turkish nationalists. And the Turkish nationalists also tried to use religion to a certain extent. In history books, you will also see a war of fatwas, one religious verdict against another sort of arguing the rights of resistance versus the rights of obedience. And both sides also settling out by the power of the sword, their differences. But the end of the war, not only that these won the war, established a nationalist government which came under the influence of that image of good society. But at the same time, they solidly believed that the religion is an ominous force used by the enemies of Turkey to mobilize troops to commit treason against them. They fought and lost the battle. And as a result of which, they were treated as those who have lost and at the same time committed treason. 
in the minds of these people. And they tried to eliminate the influence and stranglehold of religious institution and religious power from early republic as effectively as possible. Therefore, they eliminated the religious institution, established the Diyanet İşleri Başkanlığı, these religious affairs directorate, and went on to abolish the caliphate in March 1924, a few months after the Republic was established on the 29th of October 1923. So in the baggage, you also have the War of Liberation. Without the War of Liberation, it's not possible to understand why the idea of Turan was ditched for a national homeland with borders now. There is a national homeland for Turks, securing and providing welfare to those who live within those borders is the goal of the Republic. No claims on anything beyond those borders are legitimate. And that became the basis of the new definition of Republican nationalism from that point onwards. It's not an ethnic imperialist nationalism. It's more of a civic form of nationalism, more focused on preserving a national homeland and improving the lifestyle of people on that homeland and protecting their security and improving their economic welfare. And this form of nationalist change was not possible in the Balkans or in the Arab lands of the Ottoman Empire. All of them have ethnic nationalist ideas legitimating their existence and therefore claiming that they should have more land under their occupation at any point in time. Therefore, when the Syrians talk about Bilad al-Sham, they don't mean Syria today. They mean whole of Palestine, whole of the Sinai Peninsula, parts of southern Turkey. Not the same as the Turkish homeland. So no Syrian politician can argue that today's Syria's borders are legitimate borders for Syria. Syria shrank as a result of imperialist conspiracies in the eyes of these people. Not in the Turkish case. Turks fought and salvaged the land by hard fighting against the Greeks, the French, Armenians, and the Sultan's forces against immense odds. And that gave them a sense of success and accomplishment, which is quite satisfactory. So this overall trend for preserving and improving that land mass became a very important defining characteristic of the new nation state as it was established after some complex negotiations in the cities of Ushi and Lausanne. Eventually in Lausanne it was signed into a treaty on the 24th of July 1923, which establishes Turkish landmass today, except for the Syrian border, which extended further south to include Antakya in Iskenderun in 1939, and this current border between Iraq and Turkey, which had not been settled in Lausanne, but referred to the League of Nations, which settled it in 1926, Turkey accepting the border as legal and legitimate and has no claim over the south, legally, that can be substantiated under any circumstances from now on. And therefore, the border today, as complex, difficult, 
non-defensible as it is, was negotiated with the League of Nations and has stuck ever since then. It was suggested as a temporary border to be finalized eventually, but Turkey accepted that border on the basis of developments that occurred around that time, which necessitated the Turkish government to settle for that border rather than lose more under the circumstances.